This session will be recorded as all others are. They'll be archived to YouTube for the purposes of saving the world one conversation at a time and going back in time and holding uh, Ryan accountable for everything that he says, does, and uh, everything we hear in the background based on your family being in a small hotel room during spring yeah. training. <laughs> so that'll be great. Um, any questions, uh, anything anybody wants clarity on, please feel free to do so um, oh. politely um, by using the, uh, the chat box or just uh, simply... Uh, unmuting yourself and, and asking a question at a, in a timely fashion. Um, this is session 29 of Let's Chat, an athletic therapy roundtable. Really special guest this evening. Um, we go back a long time, and I was going back through this historically, just trying to remember exactly when I saw you last. But let me go through your bio because it's an impressive one, and then we'll jump into to some of the history and then where you're at now and, and how you got there and all the other good things. Um, Ryan, sure. Cro Ryan Croton's our guest tonight. He currently serves as the director of performance integration for the Los Angeles. Angels. Uh, I still can't get over the name changes and remember which one's right, but I think that's right. Los Angeles Angels of uh, Major League mm -hmm. Baseball. Um, he's spent over three and a half years with the Angels, including a previous position of player performance coordinator. He has an interdisciplinary PhD in biomechanics and exercise physiology and is a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Uh, he was a postdoctoral researcher in human performance and the pen throwing clinic coordinator at the University of Pennsylvania. He was an MLB assistant strength coach, a roving coordinator for the Baltimore Orioles between 2012 and 2014. He spent over six years, close to seven years at the University of Buffalo as a biomechanist and exercise physiologist and a volunteer assistant baseball uh, and strength coach. Well, there, uh, go go you be you buff, um, and he was also a member of uh, player development staff with the St. Louis Cardinals back in 2008 uh, to 2009. Uh, certifications include um, selective functional movement assessment level one, USA weightlifting level one, uh, and as mentioned, he is a, a CSCS and many other things. A father, uh, a husband, and uh, and uh, gracious with your time as always, man. Good to see you. It's been a while. <laughs> That's a, that is a mouthful, and that was amazing. Right? Um, that, I can't believe it. It's almost like we were roommates that whole time. You recited that perfectly and saved me the time. So. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you guys reaching out to me and, and uh, you know, for me to be able to be on with you. I know we've, we've gone back a long time uh, in our baseball days, and we've had conversations for the past few years, uh, and um, – it's amazing. The one thing that I really love about baseball, it's the relationships you make. You know, we, we all finish playing the game at some point, but um, the people who you meet in the sport, they, they last for an eternity. So I'm grateful. I'm glad to be on this with you. Hey man, grateful to have you. And uh, yeah, it's like, uh, it's like, well, it looks like no time has passed for you. You probably look better than you did back in the day. I'm getting older and grayer and balder and fatter <laughs> over here. But I'm just watching you constantly evolve into this, uh, this beast of a human being um, going through school. So, so Ryan and I just to give everybody a little bit of background. We ended up playing together. I think we were a couple years apart in terms of playing and you're always on a, another organization and then transferred over to, to the organization where I was, or I ended up catching up to you in years or playing up a year or something like that. And, uh, uh, and I always remember Ryan was teaching everybody mechanics of hitting um, down at Stan, Stan Wadlow Park in the bullpen. And uh, I remember just listening to this guy back in the day and, and he was teaching about uh, back, I think it was the back foot squishing a bug. And, and the, the, I think it was the top, I wasn't a hitter, so I was paying attention, but not really. But, yeah. and, and the top hand punching the troll in front of you, right? Was that the one? <laughs> yeah. so, something yeah. like this. <laughs> I'm sure it's yeah. evolved since then into a PhD, but probably hasn't changed that much, right? Baseball's pretty, uh, pretty standard, doesn't change too much. Yeah, the only I'd say the only thing that's changed with the mechanics is that that back foot no longer engages with the ground. So when you know people who are on this call that they're watching baseball, it's amazing if you look at the hitter's feet that there's so much force going into the lead leg, which is called the block leg, that the back foot actually picks up. So when I had gone through as a player, I was always told that it's important to keep balanced and wait evenly distributed between both legs, which is not the way that we teach hitting um, in this day and age. You're, you're going for broken to that lead leg, and if that foot comes off the ground, it comes off the ground. It just means that you're transferring energy into your lead leg. So um, the hand path that you talked about, that's still right. Okay, you know, perfect. You, 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 yeah, you, you still – we talk about be, working above the baseball, not below the baseball. So if you, if you don't punch the troll, you end up – 
you end up kind of uppercutting the troll and then you create a big J in your swing. And that's, that's something that's been consistent uh, throughout time is, is that punch the troll position. Right. And then a whole bunch of other technical terms that have crept in over the, over the years, um, you know, launch angles and all kinds of other things that we're teaching to three-year-olds now and just seeing how, <laughs> how far they can hit a freaking T-ball. But um, <laughs> anyway, everybody's a big leaguer in, until they're a big leaguer. Um, but that, that's awesome, man. And so I just recalled that story and then I was going back through and, and since announcing, you know, like I was going to have you on as a guest and you were gracious enough to, to make some time while, while there at Spring Training 2.0, um, a, a few of the, a few of the boys reached out and they're like ah oh, man it's gonna be such a good conversation they're not on here but hopefully they'll pick it up on youtube as well um there's a bunch of, pr- bunch of practitioners on here um newish uh some that have been on here for a while and a bunch of people have been picking this up on youtube so um your insight into all of this stuff even so far has been fantastic um we crossed paths i think last um at least formally in working days was uh new york pen league huh you remember yes. this in, in Bata- yeah, batavia new ago. york that was a long time ago so i was an athletic trainer with the jays in short season and ryan yeah. was uh was a strength coach right you were a strength coach with batavia at the time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so way it back was a while ago yeah <laughs> right? right uh so anyway t- times have changed things have changed uh you're with the angels now you've been there for a while do you want to just kind of walk us through um obviously baseball has been a part of your life for a long time but just kind of walk us through your your career path and and sort of uh if you ever had to divert or it was very straight and linear or or how you got to where you're at yeah so you know i'd always been connected with strength training in baseball so my best friend whose father was my first coach had uh, an uncle who donated a bench press uh to my best friend um we were about 11 maybe 12 years old we had no clue what to do with it (laughs) But um, his uncle came and he showed us how to bench press. And it was interesting to me because I didn't, I I knew I was strong. At the age of six, I could piggyback my father. So my dad could actually sit on my back at six years old and I could walk him around the driveway. And I got to try that one tomorrow. Yeah. My my neighbors, (laughs) you know, thought it was pretty hilarious seeing the six year old kid, you know, able to scoot around with his dad on his back. And so I knew I was strong, but I didn't actually have a quantified sense of that until the day I actually bench pressed. So he he taught me and um, I remember the uncle was just kind of shaking his head when he saw that I could do about uh, one and a half times my body weight as a 12 year old kid, you know, and being an inexperienced lifter. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, that to me, I, I, I kind of felt a connection to training and I knew that, you know, un- unfortunately, my genetics couldn't take me to a level that uh, I had hoped. So I knew I had to train for it. And um, that got me really interested. I remember getting into physical education at the OAC level at that time. We had 13 years of education in, uh, in Ontario. And in that year, it was mostly on exercise science theory, a lot of functional anatomy, uh, a lot of uh, communication about exercise physiology. We talked about VO2 max and some of these other uh, aspects and contraction types. And I thought to myself, you know, this is what I wanted to study in school. I wanted to have some element of this uh, as part of my academics. And so uh, I ended up getting a scholarship to the University of Maine in kinesiology. And there it was, it was really interesting because it had a lot of features from motor learning, which motor learning is a really big facet of uh, coaching in this particular game, especially uh, teaching by constraints, constraint-led approach, um, adjusting boundaries, and those kinds of things. So it was very interesting to me. But then uh, also mixing in the exercise physiology s- standpoint uh, of how you know there's interrelated systems of biochemistry. Um, and biomechanics and, and some of these other areas. So I knew I was on the right academic career path for me, um, but I always wanted to be a major league baseball player. Like that, the, the academics were uh, secondary in my dream, but they were obviously primary in, in my habits. Right. And um, I ended up getting a master's degree in physical education. And after that, I was lost. I ended up going to play into independent league baseball all over the world. I still wanted to play. Um, I was in Germany and Australia and was paid 
nicely and, and really enjoyed it. And I thought, you know, um, I want to make a, a go at this and try to be a free agent. And it didn't happen. And I came home to my, uh, to my family and they wanted me to become a doctor. So I had stacks and stacks of MCAT books to, uh, you know, dive through in terms of preparing myself for medical school. Right. And uh, at the same time, I started a small business training volleyball players. Um, I didn't even have baseball players, even though that's like my vernacular. I, I didn't have anybody who played baseball in the group. They're all female volleyball players. And I absolutely loved it. And um, when I was coming home late at night, so I'd go there probably around 1.30, 2 in the afternoon to set up for programming. And I'd come home for around 11.30 at night. I realized that I was really fastened to the point of uh, reading the NSCA's strength and conditioning journal, research journal. Yeah. And I kept kind of tossing between, am I going to keep studying for this MCAT or am I going to gravitate towards a career that is more academic based in sports science and exercise uh, sciences? So um, I came at an impasse. I said to my mom, you know, I'm going to really disappoint you here, but I know I don't want to be a doctor. Um, I, I don't have an interest in being a physician. I need to be more with athletes. I need to be um, more on a science level. And I, I think I want to do a PhD. Um, and so my mom said, where are you going to study? And I remember I, I sent out a lot of emails and the PhD game is, is not so much uh, where you go. It's who you work with. And it, you got to really sell yourself. And the, the fact that I was a master's in physical education made it really challenging um, to land a position with some of the heavy hitters uh, like William Kramer, uh, Vladimir Zatsiorsky. These are like big names in strength and conditioning science. And uh, they wouldn't have it. So I said to my mom, I said, you know, let's just drive to the University of Buffalo. Let's just see what they offer. And I said, maybe I can coach there. Too. And we drove uh, one afternoon. We were going to stay overnight. Yeah. And I ended up going to the school. And uh, as I met with the administrative official, she told me, you know, it's interesting that you came here because we just fired uh, a TA. We just fired. I guess he, you know, he might have hit on uh, a student and got in trouble. And, you know, this job was open. So she right. said, you know, why don't you give me a resume? And I wasn't even in school. We just had a conversation and she just liked what I, I had to say, I guess. So I gave the resume and she introduced me to some professors and they said, have you written your GRE? And I, I said, no, I haven't. And they said, well, you need to do that immediately. Um, and uh, there is a potential we'll find a place for you. So that was done. So I knew, okay, I had an in somewhere, right. but I still wanted to coach. So uh, the next place I went was a strength and conditioning facility. And in there, there was a group of huge strength coaches, big, big, like Nate Harvey with the yep. lead FTS. He was, he was a coach at the time. There, there were some monsters in that room. And they're all crowded around this, this guy in his late 50s, early 60s, without sleeves, wearing a UB shirt. And uh, that was Buddy Morris. I don't know if you know the name Buddy Morris, but he's the director of strength and conditioning, or I think it's player preparation, so, something like that for the Arizona Cardinals. Yep. Um, and... Um, he said to me, you know, can I help you? And I said, you know, I don't mean to interrupt, but I was wondering if you're looking for interns uh, this coming academic year. And he said, why do you ask? I said, well, I'm, I'm hopefully going to study my, uh, my doctoral education here in exercise science. And he laughed. And he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to take you on because I think you're going to need to learn something. And, and he was correct in the sense that um, exercise science programs at the time were heavily focused on cardiorespiratory fitness mm -hmm. and very, very uh, deficient in, uh, in training theory and particularly periodization um, with weight training. It was, it was almost a, like maybe four lectures that I had. And if I didn't have that experience with Buddy, I don't think I would be where I am uh, today. And at the, at the same time, I left his office, went to the baseball office, and the head baseball coach was fired the day I was there. So yeah. that means the, the assistant coach got moved to the head coach, and they had all, everybody got moved up, and they had a vacated grad assistant position. So I went on one day. 
I had, I, I basically made an entry with the school. I had a baseball coaching job. I had a strength coaching gig that I can be involved in. And I, I did that for a number of years. Um, but on the academic side, I entered uh, a program that was more nutritional biochemistry based. I wanted to see how vitamin C could protect uh, ligaments. So basically like collagen synthesis because mm -hmm. of what happens with uh, UCL sprains that I figured, you know, is it possible when an athlete has like a grade one or a low grade uh, sprain of their ulnar collateral ligament, could it be remediated partly with nutrition being vitamin C? So, you know, cause it's something that's accessible to everybody. And uh, at the time, the, the, the conservative approaches like PRP injections, those kinds of things weren't really well known. So, I felt this would be a really interesting area of study. And I spent about a week and realized this is not for me. We are injecting snake venom into rats. We are letting their tissues necrotize. We're then hitting them with heavy doses of vitamin C. And I just thought, I hate killing animals this way. And I, <laughs> that, I, that way, just in I, general. I, maybe. <laughs> yeah, 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 I don't, kill, don't want to kill animals in general. But um, I realized this is going to be a really tough course of study for me, uh, yeah. especially when I was so excited about coaching and, you know, the other things I was doing. So um, through my TA ship, uh, a prep professor came in from, he's a Canadian guy uh, from the University of Delaware, and he brought in all these cameras. And he said, look, it, I need to find a TA that's going to help me uh, oversee labs and biomechanics. And for me, I was like, I had a little bit of biomechanics um, background from my uh, kinesiology degree. It was a yep. long time ago, um, but I asked if I could do it. And then, you know, after the first three classes, the first three labs that I taught, uh, one was on the vertical jump and we looked at something called the impulse momentum theory and uh, calculating the vertical jump from force plate data. And I was just like, this is awesome. This is, this is coaching. And uh, I remember talking to him and I said, do you think you could throw a ball in here? And he said to me, he said, you know what? He's like, yeah, I think, I think you could, you can get a pitching study going here. He asked me who I was working with. And I said, I was working with a different professor. And he said, well, that could be a problem because this isn't related to your current scope of your dissertation. Right. And, uh, he offered, he went to the chair and he offered himself to be my PhD advisor. And he talked to my current advisor at the time. And they made a relationship that they said, if he gets an interdisciplinary PhD in exercise science um, with a concentration in exercise physiology and biomechanics, everything will be good to go. But he can't have one without the other. So that kind of led me on the path of studying fatigue and its impact on biochemistry, um, particularly stress hormones and uh, blood analytes as well as movement compensation. So looking at um, a paradigm for which fatigue will change how an athlete moves. Yep. And uh, that's what took me almost seven years to graduate. I also had to work in between there um, to pay for my subjects because it wasn't a funded lab. So uh, the Israel Baseball League in 2007 started and they were looking for players that played independent league um, that could get away and, and play for a, a summer season. And I sent in video and I remember I sent in a CV. So they, they never had a CV before from, from a player, you know, right. like an academic CV. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, it, it kind of resonated with the director of player development and player personnel there. Um, and he brought me on, you know, he said, yeah, we'll pay you to play, uh, to come to Israel and play for the summer. And, um, I'm just very grateful that I got the right pitch in the first game that was really well attended and it was televised. And I hit the first home run in the, in the league's history, the only year that they ever had professional baseball in Israel. Yeah. And it got a lot of attention. And afterwards, this director of, of player development and personnel uh, sat down and talked to me and asked me about my education. And this guy ended up becoming the GM of the Baltimore Orioles later on. <laughs> So I got an inbox is, is Dan Duquette and I got an inbox message in my LinkedIn when I had to come home and do my dissertation writing from my parents' house because my TA ship ran out. Um, I couldn't live in the country anymore. So um, 
he just said, Hey, I think I got a job for you. And, and that kind of began a, a bigger uh, world of uh, baseball for me. And, um, you know, it's led me to a uh, postdoc experience that I came out of baseball to take on. Um, and I enjoyed it, but I really was missing coaching and being around athletes uh, daily. And uh, out of the blue, I, I had an interview with uh, the Los Angeles Angels that they were looking for a sports science person who had a strength and conditioning background and could potentially scout. And that's what got me here. Um, wow. Yeah, just um, an amazing sort of like, I mean, we look at it and like, you can't even make this stuff up in terms of like how it lined up. And, and we talk about, yeah. this, you know, some people say coincidental timing, but you set yourself up in the right way with, with doing, you know, following your passion, obviously, um, some innate drivers within you to get all of these things done. And really following, you know, where your heart was at and, and really just chasing down what you wanted to do, not what you felt somebody else wanted you to do or, or what you felt might be next just because it was supposed to be next. It's an amazing story. And the only thing that I would uh, say would make it better is if when they asked you to write your uh, your GREs, if they just said, here, do it right here on this computer, and then you <laughs> you, you, you passed it at 100%, which no. I, don't doubt, I don't doubt that you didn't anyway. But, you know, if it had been right there that day, it would have just made that weekend a freaking no, I think it's I think it's important. I want the, the viewers that can potentially see this to know that I was a horrible standardized test taker. I had a very low SAT. Yeah. And I had I had I just met the minimum requirement on the GRE. So the thing is, is if you can get in the door, if you can get that minimum requirement, the world's your oyster because you'll get through the other stuff if you persevere um, and you're passionate about it. Yeah, I, I just had this conversation with one of the uh, the founders of Athletic Therapy in Canada just over the phone, and, and we're going to have her on later, but she was talking about that exact thing. It's like, if a door is open, you better go through it, because if you don't, mm -hmm. you'll be kicking yourself years down the road. You never know what it could have been, but if you go through it, you're going to find out exactly what was through that door, and you're going to get to wherever you want to go um, if you take it and jump in. So it brings me sort of to a lot of different areas that I want to take this just in talking to you and hearing your story, but uh, characteristics of successful people and influencers in your life and I mean you're without even knowing it you know you're one of those people for me who follow you uh, you know follow your 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 career path your education um, but the obvious things that stand out just in listening to your story and, and taking the time to be here you know drive pursuit of passion uh, resiliency not really taking no for an answer um, hum humble and polite and just like very well spoken you know um, you are what you are and, and you're on the surface and there's you know there's a lot of depth to you but there's no fluff you know what I mean and you're, you're just very to the point and uh, it's amazing to hear and it's uh, it's amazing to, to catch up with you over this uh, over this little zoom cast and for everybody else to have exposure to, to you as a as a person and a student and a, um, a strength coach as well so uh, again man I really appreciate you being on this is this is huge all of this stuff really impacts everybody as we try to connect during these times and beyond to sort of see you know help mold people and shape people and and just direct so um, yeah, I don't know. Well, you talked about fatigue, and uh, yeah. and Glenn Fleissig is obviously a big name in uh, in biomechanics sure. as well at ASMI. I uh, sure. just just listened to a podcast with him and uh, Cressy Eric Cressy talking about uh, anything, anything and everything, and and really like he's he's been published a bunch of times, and uh, and the one study that he relates to the most or says has had the most impact, and they've had a lot of impact, um, is, is pitch count. And talking about fatigue in, in the amateur athlete. So mm -hmm. um, I, I'm really interesting that, that you bring that up. And I just listened to this and, and just that, you know, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a lot of things that go on in sports science and biomechanics and technological advancement. Um, and, and then a lot of that gets watered down or the content gets delivered before the context or people take things out of context. H how do you guys do that without giving away your, your secrets with the angels? How, how do you sort of keep the athlete at the center well, there's all of this data being generated, you know, like how do you make it personal um, for athletes? Yeah, I think what's important is you have to understand the personality of your athletes. Um, I think one of the best things that I've ever read, and I definitely recommend it for everybody that's on this call, is Conscious Coaching by Brett Bartholomew. Um, I think it, it's important to first kind of understand your athlete in terms of matching what you can give them. So, some of our athletes, like there's a few that have what I would call health anxiety. 
They're yep. usually the guys that hang out in the weight room or the training room. Yeah, they're constantly needing to do something and things don't normally feel good, right? And so as an athletic therapist, I think the people on this call should really understand their language has power. So when you talk to an athlete and you say things to an athlete like this, like this feels tight, you know, um, that kind of thing can take an athlete and go in a really challenging direction where now they could end up becoming too mobile because they're working on something every day because it's been mentioned. Yep. And if they lack the end range strength, they then expose themselves to injury. So as far as the athletes, like those technical guys, those, those health anxious guys, um, I usually don't report any data. I don't show them reports or visualizations or comparative information. I just indicate the programming. Um, for example, uh, today, um, I did uh, some shoulder strength testing on some of our pitchers um, to look at imbalances using a very expensive piece of dynamometry. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a new player that we had, and he was very inquisitive about, you know, what does the data mean? What, is, what does this look like um, for me? You know, is this normal, right? And I think in that instant, I, you know, I could feel like this guy seems like an overly concerned athlete. Yep. And I had mentioned to him, I said that everything is individual and that we can't truly compare your data to another athlete's data. And we can't say that this data is going to impact your career as a major league player. All we can tell is that we use this data to individualize your arm care. This helps us program and that you should be able to trust that we're taking this data to give you what you need. And it kind of just ended that conversation there that I felt if I got into the granular details that, you know, your internal rotation strength was 10.1 kilograms and your external rotation strength was, a, I can't remember, it might've been 18 or 20, mm -hmm. um, but it, there, there was a really uh, off ratio there um, that I think it could have sparked anxiety in this athlete, yeah, no doubt. Um, which, which you don't want to do. So it's the same thing with biomechanics data, whether you guys are looking at functional strength data, range of motion data. Um, you're giving insights to an athlete about their bodies. And if they're really internal, that can be dangerous. Okay. Um, you might find that there are some, the guys that are really technical, they, they feel they're confident athletes. They're not hanging out in the weight room, fiddling around. Uh, things don't feel, you know, they feel great to them. They follow along with your programming. They don't go to you and say, I don't want to do this because I don't think my shoulder blades protract or whatever is told to you. Um, they can handle a little bit more of the, the graphical visualization. Like, you know, here are your trend lines over time, you know, and this is where we want to get to where they're not going to take a downward spike and internalize it that I am doomed. I, you know, injury is looming. So for people who are responsible, th this could be a problem. If you are a straight sports scientist and you don't have the coaching acumen and you don't relate with athletes that way and you don't see them in that way, it could be a catastrophic nightmare in terms of how you deliver data. So I, I personally believe it's so important for people on the medical team, um, the strength and conditioning team, your nutritionist, your psychologist, um, your sports scientists to all work together to understand the data and communicate amongst each other to de determine how it gets delivered. So um, I, my monitoring process has three prongs, actually a fourth. Um, observation. So we basically uh, identify what are the right data points we want to look at. Mm -hmm. Communication, which is a huge thing. Like what we're talking about is what, what are the communication strategies that have to be met, one, between us to understand what we're talking about thoroughly, and two, how do we deliver it to athletes? Yep. Um, the next is implementation. So we have to have a process by how we can continually take the data in terms of putting in a, a prescribed plan. But the fourth level is evaluation. So for you as part of that integrated team, um, you need to have the parameters to say, when do we need to pivot? It's just like a business. You know, if you're, you, you know, you're not getting uh, the value added metrics that you want, you have to be able to, as the entrepreneur, you have to be able to determine what's the next direction I'm going to take. Um, with, with this athlete, with my team, with my organization, with these coaches uh, and practitioners. So you need those four levels, I think, to have a really effective 
uh, process to improve performance and reduce injury. 100%. And, and you touch on so many great things. And it's kind of been a nice common theme here. We've had, you know, multiple practitioners that are athletic therapists, chiropractors, MDs, uh, orthopedic surgeons, and, uh, and, and not one of them has stepped sort of away from that athlete centric or that human centric model of like, mm-hmm. you need to know who's in front of you first and foremost, because if you don't, then you're missing a huge piece of the pie, regardless of its, if it's a surgery that's standard or a rehab that you've done 16 times before. Um, and then that integrative approach of, of knowing who's on the team and, and where you're you know, acknowledging value where value lies and how that's going to work together to, to really build a model um, of, of strength for the athletes, right? And as a team, yet inter and intra uh, um, personnel communication, which is fantastic to, to hear you say that that's happening at Major League Baseball and, and with that organization who's, who's you know, um, very much at the, the top end in terms of uh, progressive, um, progressive performance and looking at that as a, as a whole for, for the organization. So that's, that's amazing to hear you say that. Um, yeah, you, you touched on uh, a couple other things. We go back to sort of like the, the, the tech Right. And uh, and I know they're like biomarkers and, and like markers, like sticky markers that we're putting on people and then having them throw a baseball. There's now technology coming out that is uh, uh, markerless um, mm-hmm. technology. Um, and and w- where do you think that's going to take sort of things in baseball in the future? I mean, do you think that there's going to be a, a move to have like these cameras in the stadium that you guys are going to set up specific to your athletes so you can understand them in a three dimensional manner? Or do you think there's do you think there's still a place for like the old eyeball tests? Like the greatest scouts in baseball, most of them are, are over sixty years old, and uh, maybe not the greatest, but a lot of them are, are lifers and they catch a lot of things with their eye that that even a camera can't capture. So do you think there's a nice balance, or it's going to tip the scales? Well, you know, there are a lot of teams that are taking on um, these markerless uh, motion capture systems. And I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a world where you blend both of them. You know, there are subjective things that people see uh, in video that are really effective. And some of the things like we wouldn't be able to see from a camera. So if you're scouting, um, you know, you might see things in terms of how this athlete interrelates. Uh, with, you know, their teammates. Um, Or you might see how, you know, what's the pitchability of this athlete as far as the resilience of after, you know, a two-run homer off of them and what do they do with the next batter, the first pitch. Right. You know, there's certain things like they they can see in terms of uh, the personality characteristics of their craft. You know, we have some of those guys that are just unbelievable what they see. I mean, they see things like they scan pitchers from ground to fingertip as you should, you know, just like, like a a biomechanical uh, reporting process would. Mm -hmm. Um, But what, what's going to happen is I think the artificial intelligence of the markerless motion capture uh, systems are going to become almost as good as uh, marker based systems where you're actually putting markers over bony landmarks to identify joints and it's, it's not going to be, you know, in the next year or so, but, it, you know, as more people are using uh, these systems and feeding it data, um, the machine learning approach from being able to train uh, the AI intelligence systems, they're going to be able to identify small changes. You know, if you take one of these systems and you have like a, a floating error, so let's just say... You know, if there's uh, sometimes it might be off by five degrees when you look at a joint measure or other times it might be off by 10 degrees because there could be inconsistencies in the way that they're um, teaching the training set for the AI. Yeah. um, It's very problematic. So you kind of have to understand the bandwidth of, you know, what are you going to consider to be actionable for you? You know, so... um, but, but I do believe it's the way that the baseball is going to go, I think, at the college level and most definitely at the amateur levels that, you know, this, uh, this type of technology will be brought to a smartphone. And, um, you know, that, and, and when it hits to that level uh, and it can, it can be at an accurate, and an accurate level, uh, I think you're going to see that people like us, uh, strength coaches, you know, medical practitioners, physical therapists, athletic trainers, 
uh, people in the allied performance industry, they're going to start using it more mm-hmm. and it's going to become more um, intuitive. You see biomechanics, when I first started, it was like, it, it was sort of like this esoteric physics and biology, you know, mashed together and um, all these like long differential equations and, you know, challenging concepts where I think biomechanics is going to become very commercialized and digestible. And I think when that happens in our industry, I do think we're going to see a reduction in injuries because that is the name of the game. Yep. Um, And uh, when we're all speaking from a common perspective and a common language, um, we'll be able to make decisions. So for example, uh, people that are in the marker-based labs you know, they have different marker sets. Like you might put markers on the body differently than I do um, from my lab. And so our computations, particularly of force, they might not be consistent. So let's say I know Glenn Fleissig. I'm really grateful um, that I do know him and in, in, in the time he gives me. But we had different marker sets. You know, what I had at the University of Buffalo was not similar to his. Right. And... So the problem is when we try to agree upon a quantified number or range of what can be considered, you know, a, a high stress delivery, um, it's very difficult, you know, because we cannot, uh, we, we cannot make those relationships because we calculated them differently. Um, and the other thing too, is, as we understand biomechanics, I think we need to get more internal, yep. um, and understand tissues. And there's a lot of great researchers that are out there. I just talked to one, he's a PhD candidate. I think he just graduated. If you guys get a chance to look him up is his name's Chris Curran. And he studied at uh, Eastern Carolina university and he had just an unbelievable comprehensive research project um, where I'm hoping he publishes his data soon. That is incredibly impactful um, because he spared nothing from the internal world and the external load world and, and mashed them together um, to give you a really good perspective of, you know, what the body can handle, like, in reality, not cadaver-based, right. in pitching. Yeah, 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 some, some just amazing stuff coming out, and, and uh, um, I'll throw all these resources up on the, on the YouTube channel as well in the discussion section, so if you're writing these down frantically, I'll make sure that we go back and, and throw these up. Um, you touched on so many great people, and, and I'm just going to bring you back to um, – um, Mr. Bartholomew's read, you know, conscious coaching is a big one. I, I blurred through it and then I came back around to, to reading it again. And, and I, I read something this morning and I'm just going to read it just so everybody hears it. But this was just in one of his chapters and I, I just pulled it up because I, I'm a, a bit of a geek. I just take pictures of what I'm reading so that I can go back to certain elements. But uh, um, he was talking about a British behavioral researcher, Daniel Nettle, who provides a tremendous example when discussing the famed Galapagos finches. Nettle elucidates that the Galapagos finches with small beaks do well when the climate is favorable as they can quickly peck many seeds. However, when drought comes, natural selection favors finches with, lar- with large beaks so as to better penetrate the barren soil. The Darwinian example is the inspiration behind the old survival of the fittest man mantra that is often misinterpreted by many who think that the fittest refers to physical strength when in reality it references an organism's ability to be adaptable to its surroundings and I read that and I was just like man bam that's just like one of those things that that we sometimes leave out and we sometimes forget to go come back around to when we're treating or when we're coaching or when we're talking to another human being but that adaptability factor uh, based very much in technology in your world I'm sure but also in that human element of having access to to the roster having asset access to the personnel that you have the coaches that you have access to and making that communication part really gives you access to to find out how to tweak and manage you know adaptability per person, right? Like we can blanket cookie cutter program for however we want, but when we're not adaptable enough in our own professional skill set, the athlete is the one that ends up losing out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, you just talked, t- talked about that. And I had just taken this picture like this morning. So I was like, all right, he's, he just talking the same language. Let's jump in here. So that, that's amazing, man. Listen, you're, you're currently in LA, right? And that's where uh, you guys are at the stadium and doing spring training 2.0, I think we're calling it. Yeah. Yeah. Our, um, I have to say our front office, uh, is amazing. Yeah. Um, our GM is like a incredibly forward thinking, 
a uh, real person, you know, real, real person, a guy you can have a conversation with, yep. uh, loves the performance component of, uh, what we offer. Mm-hmm. Um, he looks at us as like the pit crew, you know, keeping, keeping the cars on the road and, you know, gives us, uh, you know, the right, uh, finances needed for education, technology, Great way uh, to look at speakers, those, yeah. those kinds of things. And I feel like they've done such a good job as far as how to organize our uh, spring training 2.0 process by having two locations. So we have, uh, we have it organized at this angel stadium yep. and, uh, we, we also had a, a college site in long beach and, um, just, just kind of just a seamless way of how the day works. Very efficient. You know, you're coming in, you're getting screened. Um, you're not hanging around, you're getting to your work. Uh, players are, uh, very respectful of the, uh, the boundaries. So like our front office and our manager, Joe Madden, some of our key players had really laid the foundation of how we need to interact in this new normal. You know, we, we, we need to do things to uh, protect ourselves as uh, not just teammates, but as family, yep. as Angel's family. Because if I look after you, you look after me. And in that case, it, it lowers our, uh, our rates of infectious disease. And it's, it's really interesting because I'm, I'm finishing a publication with a group um, that studies uh, Japanese injuries and MLB injuries. And the, uh, the highest... Uh, injury listings, the most frequent are, are illnesses, mm-hmm. internal illnesses. Okay. Um, they occupy the most reports. And I do feel that at this current moment, what we've had to deal with with COVID-19, I believe the strategies that we have in place and the behaviors that are going to come from this event are going to, to uh, improve our health statistics um, because, uh, prior to, I think we were more casual with wiping down equipment with wearing protective, uh, uh, masks, uh, gloves, uh, hand washing and hygiene. I think that this is all going to come out in a positive place for health, uh, in baseball. Um, so that's, that's just something that, you know, we've been experiencing here. Uh, during this interim of our our uh, programs, yeah, uh, and and maybe even like the world in general, right? Like even you look yeah. at sort of some of the comorbidities, and you look at a lot of things that are being published from the health and performance world, and it's like you know, uh, you know, metabolic rate and cardiorespiratory systems that you, you talked about as the sort of the, the forerunner back in the days of of biomechanics and and PhD studies were very much in that realm. Um, we know what what is good and what is not. Um, but it sometimes falls by the wayside and, you know, it's, it's awful to, to have to lean on something like this to make a change. But at the same time, we, we sometimes can, can just make that lemonade out of the lemons and, and start making some changes. So you talk about like the literal stuff and the stuff in baseball, but, uh, for humanity as a whole, I think some of those applications are, are certainly beneficial. So, um, mm-hmm. re- really, really good stuff. That's, that's, a that's amazing and, and great insight. Um, Joe Madden being there is obviously like a, uh, a whole nother their world I, I just you know the media covers him fairly well when he was with the Rays and doing some stuff and all and with the Cubs as well when he was doing you know with the players and some of the stuff that he does does just sort of recenter them and allow them to be themselves and just kind of um, go about their day but also you talk about spring training and spring training 2.0 uh, and you just kind of knock out some of the redundancy with this as well right get in get out and spring training mm-hmm. is a is a freaking grind and you want to talk about we we know that fatigue contributes to injury yet spring training days go from uh you know 6 30 a.m to to 6 p.m for, for minor leaguers at least and it's the big league guys that sort of get cut loose so maybe this will maybe this will change the whole thing and just kind of like trim the fat a little bit and like get in get out move in in pods move in and like you know they're doing that with school and considering that for school so um that's great to hear that there's a lot of forward thinking going on in baseball and <clears throat> i don't know i look forward to, to to, to watching some baseball for sure and uh, and getting caught up that way, but uh, maybe not in the stadium anytime soon, but certainly uh, watching it happen and, and the developments. And you know what? Like I think with all the resources that go into baseball and pro sports, maybe you set the precedent, right? There's going to be a lot of data gathered from, from athletes going back to activity that the rest of the world mm-hmm. can use, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Cool. Great stuff. Um, Japanese Major League Baseball, before we get to this, and you're looking at like the crossover of injuries. Uh, yep. an- anecdotally, uh, the guys who have never been injured playing in Japan and then they come to the Major Leagues and, and then they get injured, they blow out their UCL. Are they doing something different? Is this something that's being looked into? Is it something that's, that's maybe more than anecdotal? Or is it just like, yeah, it's just because there's only a few that are being um, broadcast on <sighs> Well, you know, I'm starting to like, I have a meeting after this with the the Japanese research group that okay. we're looking at this data, but um, there are some differences. There's some marked differences between MLB and the NPB, yep. the Nippon Professional Baseball League. And uh, one of the things is that um, the pitching rotations are yep. different. So right. if you're a pitcher in, in the NPB, you're, you're pitching virtually every seventh day. And, um, Typically, I, I need to confirm this, but I believe every Monday is an off day in MPB. I believe that's what they have uh, listed. Um, they also have much fewer athletes in their minor, minor league system. Right. So they're kind of the ratio, I think, of uh, medical officials, strength officials to player, I think could be potentially better. Um, you know, if you're an affiliate, you got a lot of athletes to deal with. And sometimes you don't get to have your hands on all of them because athletes typically, they go in to see someone in the uh, sports medicine field when something isn't feeling well, right. you know, it's it, the, the maintenance aspect is at times not as encouraged or celebrated as it is in Japan. Um, you know, a lot more, I think there's a little bit more um, hands-on approach to the preventative aspect that's not reactive. Yep. Um, what else can I tell you between those two leagues? The, the travel, right? Yep. So, so you don't have, you know, such shifts in time zones or long flights um, that you have to battle uh, opposed to what we have here in the MLB that uh, can really um, kind of influence, I think, the, the health data. So, you know, some of those conditional differences um, – can make us maybe look at this data and say, are there things from the MPB that we should maybe adapt? And then also from them, um, is there a way in which they better prepare, you know, their players for MLB riggers, right? For the transition. Yeah. um, Another thing that I found interesting is that the surface, when it comes to pitchers, the surface that they pitch on is different. So for us in the U S in North America, uh, in pro baseball, it's clay, right? It's a very hard, hard surface. And when it's in Japan, they use something that's almost like a volcanic uh, soil. It's very soft. It's powdery. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a recent study. There's been two known studies that looked at Japanese biomechanics versus American biomechanics and pitchers. One was a college study and another was a professional uh, subgroup And they found that the consistency between them is that the Japanese pitchers actually had a softer lead knee. So they didn't block the same way that uh, an American pitcher would in terms of having a more extended knee through uh, ball release. And part of that could be now we have a change in surface and potentially a change in mechanics, right? And so if the, and nobody's really studied the, the transition or change in biomechanics going between leagues within a pitcher. Yeah. So that's a big deficit in the data that we may find that they're, you know, the surface alone changing ground reaction force profiles are enough to create kin- kinetic chain changes that can increase load to a shoulder elbow in a Japanese player that comes here. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things uh, between the two leagues that may, you know, cause an athlete once they come here to be at a higher risk. Yeah. Cool. Very, very cool. And like I geek out on this stuff. I removed from the baseball world, but very much, uh, uh love it and, and just love talking about this stuff. Um, and, and then I pull up like, uh, um, a 2018 article that says a uh, stride length, the impact on propulsion and bracing ground reaction force and overhand throwing. <laughs> and there's this guy named Ryan Croton, who's the co-author on that one. So, I mean, uh, uh, you're ahead of the game, and I think very much this, there's 
the surface, uh, the stride length, the biomechanics and the surface, the interplay there, and like the change of all of these things, adrenal fatigue, circadian, you know, circadian rhythm fatigue, scheduling, throwing, days of throwing, all of these mm -hmm. things come back around to your your central piece of bio, biochemistry, right? Biochemistry and stress hormones and, and movement mm -hmm. compensation through fatigue, right? Like yep. these are all things that we know as, as if there's one thing we know in, in performance and in, in rehab scenarios, uh, regardless amateur or pro, is that fatigue is a factor when it comes to injury. So uh, yeah. uh, that's, a, that's a nice little tie-in to everything that you've done. And uh, uh, man, I, I look forward to reading. I think, so if this one is goes to publication, that'll be what, like 20 or something? I think your, your, your profile said 19 uh, publications. You yeah, lost count. I'll, yeah, I'll just it, pump your tires there's, some more. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a few that are coming. I'm just very grateful because there are a lot of people that say, okay, we need uh, somebody who has expertise in this area. Um, and, uh, through some of my professional networks, it was like, Hey, do you want to jump on a paper with me, uh, and do a little writing and kind of look at our results. And, uh, again, I work for an unbelievable organization where they, you know, they really are, um, supportive of promoting health yeah. through research and baseball. Like there's a few of us that, um, are involved in publications, uh, are, um, head physical therapist, and he's actually got the title of director of player performance. Mm -hmm. He researches uh, uh, hamstring injuries. He's like one of the foremost experts in MLB on hamstring injuries. And so, you know, we get a lot of support that way. And we connect with a lot of people that way that I'm just fortunate that, you know, there are people that have asked for me to be involved in these things. Um, I have another paper coming out with my professor it's going to be really cool, very new for the, for the, the pitching world. It's all on knee and ankle biomechanics um, in pitchers and how stride length is, is affecting those things. Yeah. Um, so that, that just uh, was submitted. We, we have a conditional acceptance. Yep. So for, for you know, people on the call, I'm sure there's probably some that have gone through um, the peer review process. It's, it's really anxiety-driven because you don't know who's reading it. Um, they're attacking everything that you're saying, which is right. really, really rigorous, but it took a, a while to get this one through. I mean, it took three revisions for them to really say, okay, this is where we want it. Um, but it's going to be really interesting because like ground reaction force, you know, the, the foot is obviously the joints that are closest to the ground, but the next propulsive joint is your ankle. Right. And so um, a lot of people in the medical community uh, even the athletes, they might not spend a lot of time understanding their feet and their ankle, you know, as far as what that means to develop friction and what that means to develop the right force vectors, um, you know, and athletes. So, so athletes that I believe evert the foot uh, early, they, they really can, they're losing efficiency, you know, because they're losing friction. So some athletes like pitchers sometimes hook the rubber where the, the inside cleats are actually off the rubber and the outside cleats are actually on the rubber so that they feel they have a pulling sensation off the rubber of the mound. And what can happen is if the ankle, uh, if they have feet that I believe pronate easily, you know, they're going to get into eversion early. And when you have eversion like that, you lose friction. And if you lose friction, you lose force. And if you lose force from your lower body, what happens? Yeah. You're going to have to pick it up somewhere else. And generally that's at the shoulder and elbow. Yeah. So there's all, there's all these different relationships that uh, I think are unforeseen that we're going to get into uh, in the world of pitching biomechanics. Yeah, that's awesome. I can't wait to, to get on those and so start reading on those ones. I know um, uh, 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 that the ankle dorsiflexion has become so sexy in the performance world. It almost gets yeah. beat. It almost falls on deaf ears. But it, it, it makes sense if you're a ground-based athlete, and that is uh, virtually every athlete, except the ones that are water or air-based. But, um, you know, ground-based athlete, if, if, if you're not understanding what's happening there, and I don't mean like 
you know, consciously understand, but you're, you're not at least internally understanding what's happening at the most distal point and the, and the propulsionary joint of uh, interaction of the ground and your ankle, foot ankle, then, uh, then yeah, you're at a bit of a loss. So like, you know, we, we ask athletes to, to do certain things, you know, pick up, uh, I don't know, I just think of standard rehab with like uh, shin splints when I go back to school and they're like, ah, oh, just pick up some marbles or pick up a towel. And it's the most, you know, it turns into a useless exercise, but it can be the most beneficial exercise uh in a knee rehab in a hip rehab in a if it's if it's done with intent and it's done correctly right to like get that distal yeah. connection and and uh and and utilize because the toes and the feet and the ankle are going to be used in every step you take and everything else you do so really really cool and there's a lot of good stuff out there and, and more to come obviously through you that's amazing man i can't wait to read it so i'll stay on that one um not that you don't have enough to do uh but i promised you <laughs> I, I promised you 9 30 and it's 9 27 so i don't know if we're gonna have any any room this is just time flying well i you know i'm okay, okay? because i put i push back this meeting for a little bit because i felt that there may be questions i, I didn't know the format if you know, people on the call want to, you know, pose questions to me or. Yeah, yeah. Um, there I'm, really I'm is there. no format. We just kind of wing it. Okay. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like going to, eat to Wadlow Park and you just kind of like whoever shows up, you just roll with the roster yeah, and yeah. Uh, you might play center field today if, uh, if, uh, what's his name's not here. So yeah, if there are any questions for, for Ryan, please feel free to type I, in the, type in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. I'd love, I'd love to, uh, I, I'm just going to scroll over. I kind of like to get to know some of the people on this call. Um, and, and, you know, kind of how they've experienced baseball or throwing athletes. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really open to, uh, to the questions that could be posed. I hope I can answer them. Yeah, I know there's, uh, there's definitely uh, one or two that have spent some time in baseball for sure. Uh, others that work uh, in swimming and, and overhead athletes and things like this, where there is definitely some crossover. Um, sure. prop propulsion of an object versus propulsion of body, you know, that changes some things. So there might be some good questions there. So uh, anybody who has anything, just feel free to drop them in the box here or, or just unmute. Um, there's a, a colleague uh, who just moved from Toronto back to Montreal who, who spent a lot of time in baseball and he was asking me uh, he's not typing here maybe he is I don't know maybe he's not even there because uh, I don't know but uh, he was asking me about amateur baseball and how to sort of make an impact in amateur baseball and I think a lot yeah. of this stuff um, you know how do you prove your worth Well, you go in and you talk yeah he's there um, you, you, how do you prove your worth in baseball or how, not necessarily prove your worth but how do you make inroads in a sport that's very traditional um, and is sort of slow to the uptake in Canada at least to have uh, an ATC or CATC you know in Canada Canadian Athletic therapist um, or a certified athletic therapist in Canada um, uh, latch on or sort of like lead the way in terms of supporting athletes and supporting teams right yeah I think you know the only way we're going to get ahead of injuries in baseball is with education and outreach and uh, you know a lot of what happens too at the amateur level is there's a significant pressure to specialize in sport and yep. along with specialization right we know that that throwing a ball thousands and thousands of times from the time you're six <laughs> years old and yeah. doing very little else is going to create some significant asymmetries. And so I think to make an impact in amateur baseball, I think it, it comes from putting yourself out there uh, and trying to interrelate with travel teams, you know, or baseball leagues and giving them inf insight and information in terms of how they can do a better job protecting the health of those athletes. Yep. And I think that builds a name because, um, you know, you're, you're, you're making yourself visible to a group of, uh, of athletes and parents that might not otherwise know that you're there, right? Uh, I think one of the stigmas with athletic therapy is that it's very, like, the thought process is it's reactionary. Like, if I go to an athletic therapist, that means I have a problem. Yeah. Something's hurt, right? Where, um, you know, trying to think of, like, what my GM says about, you know, the pit crew. It's like, if we, if we started to look at, at, at our uh, at our medical community in that way, yep. where uh, I can go there when I feel good to you know get my spark plugs changed or put a little oil in the engine or you some know, nice nice rims, get some nice yeah, rims on nice there. rims. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna <laughs> keep you on the road. Yeah. So you know, I think that's really important. I, I would just encourage everybody who's on this call to um, you know think about how can I create outreach and educate people. There are lots of athletes. I mean, sports is a bazillion dollar business, you know, amateur sports, a bazillion dollar business. 
there's so many athletes, so many teams, uh, so many parents that are begging for information um, and, you know, a personal touch, you know, Hey, I, I want to come in and I want to talk to your athletes about shoulder health, you know, or I want to teach them about what they can do to improve scapular humoral rhythm uh, and have just a whole, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes of giving them insights that goes a long way, you know, and there's strength coaches that are assigned to a lot of these teams that I think too can improve their, uh, their understanding of um, prevention by having someone come in from the medical community. You know, there's a, there's a differential diagnosis process that, you know, the people on this call have that strength coaches don't really, they're not exposed to unless they're really reading and they're, they're having focused time um, with somebody in the field, they won't have, you know, that understanding of what's called regional interdependence where, you know, one area that's got a problem is the, the root cause and the manifestation in another is just the result, you know, for, you know, how someone in the, the medical field thinks is, you know, phenomenal because they're treating the root cause before the actual presence of injury. And those kinds of things are important, you know, and, and uh, I think that's how you make an impact through your ability to educate and, and wanting to do that is, uh, is important. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome insight. And, and making, um, I always sort of think of us as, as a conduit between sort of the science and the performance, you know, or science and the athlete or science and the parent or science and the coach where you can take a lot of the semi undigestible material that's out there, digest it, chew it down, do all the things that you need to do and then produce something to parents or coaches or athletes that is relatable. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you look at some of these things, you listen to podcasts, but you also gain the context by reading, uh, reading the studies for yourself and knowing that how you want to contextualize that article is, is also a bias. But at the same time, like there's a lot of good material out there, a lot of good people that are willing to help with this kind of thing. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I just think like there's a lot of, there's a lot of good stuff out there on pitch counts. Um, Dr. Andrews and ASMI obviously have uh, I think it's called smart, is it smart pitch or smart, smart pitch. Yeah. yeah with smart, MLB. Yeah. Smart pitch with MLB. And then they have, um, you know, a lot of good articles in terms of like just some, numbers that you could throw at people like uh i think it's a uh, hundred innings or something like that it just turned out to be a really round number in one of the articles they wrote um that had the most statistical significance in terms of like if a, if a child a developing athlete reaches a hundred innings in a season they are more susceptible to injury than than anybody else so as pitcher specific but just going through the data and and presenting some of that doesn't have to be your material if you can relate it and sort of bring it and bring that personal experience and, and knowledge. It's amazing. That's a great, great insight. Um, yeah. Thoughts on sidearm pitchers from a biomechanics injury potential perspective is a question that just came in. Um, obviously like arm angle and things like that. And mm. yeah, what you have at that. One. Um, yeah. The, there's been a few studies on sidearm pitchers and they are very unique in the sense that most overhand pitchers, when they hit at foot contact, Mm -hmm. their, their torso is closed. So um, that has shown that it, it reduces actual load on the shoulder and elbow. And when you get to a sidearm pitcher, the sidearm pitcher typically has an open chest at foot contact. Um, and so what happens is the arm gets extended away and there's a little bit more of a disconnect between the forward progression of the torso and kind of the, the outstretched arm moving around that, um, that relationship. Um, what I would say for sidearm pitchers, they typically don't throw as hard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, velocity is, is one of the main attributes for injury. You know, essentially, if you're throwing at higher velocity, especially if you're bigger, um, you got heavier masses, you're going to have higher forces. Now, when, when it comes to the sidearm pitcher, they, don't, they typically don't throw as hard. But, you know, getting the understanding of biomechanics, and this is a great question, is how to customize arm care. So if you know that there's going to be more elbow distraction forces, more tensile stress to the medial elbow for a sidearm pitcher, that's something that you need to consider in their arm care, that you should have an elbow stabilization type of process, right? And a lot of uh, overhand... Uh, medical performance specialists really focus on the scapula uh, and the rotator cuff where, you know, the forearm work is typically taken care of 
in grip during deadlifting or pull-ups or other gross motor activities where uh, the real important ones are the off-axis ones like pronation, supination, deviation. You know, these are things that, you know, I think they need to, uh, to, to realize. So it's important. It's a great question, you know, as far as, you know, some of the different needs between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Great insight. Great question. Uh, just thinking sort of outside the box. And one thing for me when I was in, you know, still in baseball specifically was, was kind of just meeting every day, going over what we're doing, what we're not doing, and then seeing injuries go up. And as injuries go up, that would take me aside. Let me stay on my, on my current thought. Um, waiting until surgery happens to do uh, uh, a, surgery, a surgical uh, rehab protocol. Instead of implementing it beforehand and being a little bit right. more pr progressive in, in terms of what we're thinking and what we're doing, right? right. Um, so, yeah, really, really good stuff there. And, and you also talk about, you know, um, yeah, so making it customizable. And then, again, that comes back to that adaptability component. And, and I'm, just, mm -hmm. I'm just about to take on something I've never done before, but I'm going to coach some little, little tykes on, in baseball um, just a couple times a week and, and really looking forward to it. But they keep sending me little video tidbits of, of what they're teaching kids and how they're teaching kids to throw. And it's all well-intentioned. But every time I see a, a child throw right now in, this, uh, in the little video tidbits, and I'll generalize to say that's probably uniform across the board, is they, as soon as they release the ball, it's almost that they recoil. So they don't really mm. allow allow the arm and, and like almost like this follow through. Whereas yeah. if I'm if I'm teaching a, a, a child to throw, I, I want as much decelerative you know range as possible, probably, and, and mm -hmm. almost like like do a barrel roll when you release the ball, like just go mm -hmm. until you fall over. I don't know, just interesting stuff when you watch sort of like the development and how much uh, how much. Uh, implication there is to, to how we're teaching at the younger levels and then you get them and you get them and you have Mike Trout and you know Otani and you have uh, Albert Pujols on the roster and these guys that have have been doing it forever and uh, and and it's a whole different ball game pun intended at that point um, and to customize and also relate to the fact that they've been doing it for a long time so you're not going to be able to overhaul everything all at once if you even if you feel it's the right thing to do right yeah I mean I, I love that you're talking about the you know the starting level of baseball, the grassroots. So I, I did write a paper on using a baseball bat mm -hmm. um, as an implement to improve forearm strength. It's in the journal of strength and condition. It's strength and conditioning journal. Yeah. And I think I would love for that kind of thing to uh, take hold in the uh, amateur community and using their gloves. Like as soon as these athletes start throwing, there has to be some kind of preventative training. You know, they're, they're, they, can't, they can't do something at such high velocities without strength work. And typically, kids will have a glove. They can put a ball in it. It'll be about a little over a pound. Um, they'll have a bat. They can use a bat almost like what we call an elbow mojo, mm -hmm. you know, where there's, there's weight on one side and there's a handle, yep. you know, and, and they, can, they can utilize these tools and start, you know, an arm strength process from an early age. Yep. And... Uh, you know, that kind of thing, we just have to be creative as far as how, how do we get the training to a young athlete and how do we ingrain this habit so that they know that they need to do it? You know, yeah. one, it, it, it probably becomes a, an external pressure of the parent originally, but eventually it becomes intrinsic for the athlete to say, you know, this is like brushing my teeth. This is just what I do yeah. to be able to compete in this game. And you know what? It's going to help me throw harder. Yeah. And I think another thing that I did with kids um, as far as improving deceleration qualities is you have to have them move at speed. So usually what happens when kids start throwing, they kind of get into a T position and it's like step and throw, right? Yep. Yep. Step and throw, step and throw. What I would do with these young kids is I'd say, hold a ball, run like it's a javelin and try to throw it. Yep. Run as fast as you can and try to throw it. And it's going to look go goofy at the beginning, but they're going to teach themselves to throw with their body and less yep. with their arm. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and building the coordination pattern in that way, I think is really helpful for kids. Yep. And it might help that, that kind of like pie, I'm going to stop throwing it. And it's like, I end the catapult here, yep. um, which can be much more stressful to a developing joint. Yeah. And, th and then even like running after the ball, go get that ball. And, and then, uh, that, that, yeah, and there's your recovery before the next time yeah. you pick up a ball to throw, throw it, it you know? race. Yeah. Race the other kids to see who can get their 
who can throw the ball the furthest yep. and race them to get to your ball. You know, you can make it, you can make it fun with the, with, with baseball. I mean, yeah, that's you, awesome. You just designed tomorrow's practice. So I appreciate that. Uh, and, <laughs> Javelin uh, contest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But stay in your lane and stay six feet apart. And that's the next <laughs> yeah. part of it. Um, yeah. uh, you talk about off axis stuff and pronation and supination and how they, you know, RTC and, and scapular mechanics and, and scapular humoral rhythm are, are very, you know, that's what overhead athletes should be training. Um, has, I just thought of it as you're talking about developing grip strength in the gym through deadlifting and gripping and snatch and like whatever other things people are doing with weights in their hand. Like, like do you ever deadlift with like just the throwing fingers? Um, you know, we, we talked about a lot of strain. There, you have to, there, yeah. There, yeah. There's, there's, there's certain things like there's a lot of research that talks about these two fingers yeah. Right. Being uh, related to, you know, basically the muscle groups that overlay the UCL, mm -hmm. you know, finger strength, being able to improve the stability of the medial elbow. Right. And, um, you know, a lot of a lot of what happens with grip is your thumb is wrapped around it. Right. And so what happens is a lot of the, the, the muscles of the thumb, they kind of shield some of the force that's needed by the fingers. And so doing things by having a thumb wrapped over with more of a hook grip, you know, uh, not, not really using your thumb and gripping can help improve like your, your finger dexterity and your finger strength. And so those are some adjustments that can be done, you know, um, in, in training. But mm -hmm. I, I do think that, you know, you should have some element of what to do with your fingers as far as uh, flexion um, to, to gain stability because – when we hold a ball, right, even, even when, you know, it could just be ball squeezes, yep. you know, you're, you're just, you're developing some isometric tension that can be held at the elbow joint, yep. you know? Um, so I, I think that's a great question. Yeah. And, and, and then the next part, like I just have happened to have baseballs sitting behind me, but, great. but yeah. you just, yeah. So, so you're holding the ball and, and even just like squeezes on a firm ball or even like a stress ball and then just yeah. adding simple, simple pronation to, to flexion at the same time. For so, sure. so you're mimicking stuff and that's stuff that can be done, uh, you know, in the dugout as a six year old and you're not strength and conditioning, you're not going to, you know, break their growth plates and all the, all the boo boo that's out there about strength and conditioning when it's done the, the wrong way with young kids. So, uh, some really cool stuff that we can implement at, at the younger levels and make it fun, right? Like you just have a ball and you can draw a little face, but anyway, I'm just thinking about tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's plan. Sure. So. <laughs> sure. All right. Last question. And then I'm gonna let you get out of here. Um, how does the pitcher's biomechanics change? I think after having Tommy John surgery, if they do, uh, and do players tend to have a harder time uh, getting those mechanics or proper biomechanics back, uh, for pitching after the surgery? This is the million dollar question. There it is. Okay. So nobody really knows because there's not a lot of perspective research that's been done to be able to identify the baseline of the athlete when they come in, mm -hmm. then the injury presence, and then what happens after. So this is this uh, question, unfortunately, I can't, I can't answer very well because there, there hasn't been a lot of studies to do that. And um, there was one study to look at the differences between uh, injured pitchers and, uh, in, and healthy pitchers. And the problem was that the, the injured pitchers had been rehabilitated. So what they found in this study, it was Fleissig study, it was a good study, but they didn't find anything different. Right. They virtually found, uh, and it was different like with a slap injury, like a slap injury, depending on how things are anchored, you know, the athlete's going to lose external rotation. You know, that, that happens. Um, and it happens in a good, good amount of, of cases where they kind of figure out ways to kind of work around that, that lack of range. Um, but as far as the Tommy John surgery, you know, nobody really knows, you know, what do, do they carry the ball differently? Do they supinate less? Like if you, you know, if you take your arm back into external rotation, if you have a, if you have a pronated grip on the ball and you take it back, your bicep kind of gets in the way. Right. right. And if you turn your hand supinated, you can lay the arm back further. Like, I don't know, does, does something change with getting into maximal external rotation? Does the athlete become more pronated or does he become more supinated in his position based on potentially this injury? Um, Cause we know supination opens up the elbow joint more. So these are, th this question is, 
is awesome. It's one that I wish I could answer. Um, I would love to, if Major League Baseball decided that all teams would coordinate together and just determine, you know, pull all this data and understand where the injuries stem at the beginning, um, we may have a, a little bit closer uh, connection to understanding how to prevent, you know, these injuries or, you know, how to go through the RTP process to regain what the athlete had, yep. right? A lot of times, um, I think when, you know, potentially all the people on this call, they may not have access to a biomechanics lab. They might not have, you know, the right equipment to be able to evaluate, you know, the movement of their athletes. So what could potentially happen is that the athlete that has gone in for this injury has not made any change in the way they deliver. And they may have this, this pathomechanical approach that they had pre-existing maintained because it's a learned uh, motor action because of this injury. So um, love this question. Unfortunately, I cannot answer it, but uh, it's, I, uh, <laughs> it's, it's awesome. It, it gets my wheels spinning all the time. Like yeah. what could be, what could be to really keep everybody healthy, you know, yeah. and it's hard, it's hard uh, in, in pro baseball because, you know, teaming up with other teams, it means there's, there's sharing of data. You know, and, and that's, that's also, you know, quite frightening for a lot of teams that want to keep those things close to their chest. Yep. So there may be in the future where, you know, these 3D mo uh, uh, markerless motion capture systems just say, you know, maybe they give you a discounted rate if you offer your, your uh, data to research. Like it might be that might have to come to that because, you know, baseball injuries are incredibly expensive, especially mm -hmm. for a pitcher that might be you know, 20 plus million dollars a year, you're, you got sunk costs and salary, you know, and it may affect ticket sales because people want to come to see this pitcher pitch and they get kind of put off that he's not going to be there. Right. You know, it's, there's, there's all sorts of things that could stem from an injury and not to mention, you know, thinking of the athlete, the emotional cost that they have to go through and thinking I'm falling behind. Will I be the same? You know, how come people are not, you know, I'm not with my team the same way. You know, teammates check in on me, but I'm not there grinding with them. Like, there is a psychological cost of injury um, that, uh, you know, we could maybe stave off for a lot of these guys to play. Yep. Yep. Uh, another, another three hour conversation. I think we could jump in and just stay on here until it's time to go because I feel like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I'm just writing a whole bunch of stuff down because you and me are going to have a lot of conversations in the future about this once you get out of. Uh, spring training in the season or whatever that looks like. But, um, you know, uh, th those are, those are all areas that, that we all need to consider and, and consider, uh, quite heavily, you know, and making decisions. And you talk about this being a question that you can't answer. I think that that's, that's the gist of it. And that, that makes, um, just putting that out there, you know, it's not an answerable yeah. question at this point. And, and understanding that it's really nice because, because I go back uh, to the last guest I had on, who's a PhD. She studies motor control. She does a bunch of stuff with concussion. And, and when it comes down to it, like we over science things to the point that sometimes that we actually don't know as much as what's out there. What we think we know, we, we know very little about. And, yeah. and this is, this is a similar sort of strain. For in sure. That. Yeah, the top guy in the in the biomechanics world. And the, I'm not the top know, guy. Performance That's Glenn Fleissig, man. Listen, you're the top guy on this conversation, and you're the top guy. <laughs> you're the top guy, and uh, you're captaining my ship for sure. So you can uh, just keep steering and just make sure we don't hit anything uh, massive that we can sink. But I think uh, <laughs> you've kept us afloat for for a good uh, hour and twenty minutes tonight. And um, you know, you're in spring training. You have your family there. Uh, I'll let you. I'll let you go. And and really appreciate your time, Ryan, being here. Uh, I know everybody else really appreciates this this is some massive insight into into baseball into professionalism and just in the way listening to you speak and how passionate you are and humble you are with all of this this has been uh has been fantastic um i'll reach out again off off camera off site here uh and uh, wish you the best for spring training and all the best to the family and everybody and and uh uh, I'll make sure that anybody who reaches out on my end uh, knows you're okay, and uh, and and you're just you're just making things happen. That's amazing. Man. Awesome. If there if there are other questions that come up, um, you know, if they they can funnel through you, you can get me in a lot of different ways and get the answers out to the people you need. Um, definitely open to that. And I thank everybody for listening to me for uh, over an hour. So yeah, it, uh, it flies, man. Yeah, I just hope everybody's well and uh, healthy. Their families are good. And uh, together we'll get through this. And I, I think uh, 
a new normal is is coming down the pipeline and i think if we can all grasp that and appreciate that you know life is still life we still can have stress uh, we can still have joy and we can still enjoy baseball. We're all going to be in a good place. That's it, man. V- very well said. Um, this has been Let's Chat, an athletic therapy round table session 29 with Ryan Croton. Uh, again, Ryan, really appreciate everybody who's on the call tonight and everybody who picks us up in the future. Uh, we are all indebted to you and grateful that you could take the time out. So thank you very much. And I'll wish oh. you a good night. Yeah, thank you to you. Take care. All right, man. Good night. Okay.